I'm going to open and read from my Bible, and that will give them time to put the Chinese scriptures on the, um, on the screen for those of you naughty people that didn't bring your Bibles to church. <laughs> and I, we really do want to encourage people to bring their Bibles because we want you to read what we're reading in its context, see where it's in the Bible, and we just get to know your way around the Bible a lot more. Can you say amen? Are you guys going to play hard to get and be very quiet and make it me work hard tonight? Okay. So it's okay to just say amen. If that's not politically correct, you can say a woman, <laughs> a person, amen, whatever. It just means we agree. That's the truth. And it just, it's, I like speaking to people that talk back to me. Glenda always talks back to me. <laughs> and so I feel very shocked when people don't talk back to me. And I'd explain that to the Malaysians, and they really came to the party big time. So people said, we've never seen them so responsive. I said, because I'm an African, and in Africa, we jump and shout and throw our Bibles in the air when he's preaching, and we get excited about it. So because the good news is so good. And so what I, what I want to talk tonight, we've been talking about the power of the blessing. We've been talking about the seed of Abraham. We've been talking about how to create Eden-like environments and atmospheres around your life, in your home, and in the place of work, in the church, and in the city of Hong Kong. And uh, so we're going to continue on that. But tonight I want to talk about, uh, now this is going to be a difficult word for some people to even believe I'm going to be preaching on this. I want to talk about the vengeance of God. But... <laughs> But I want to talk about his vengeance from the point of view of him giving you justice. In other words, you as the seed of Abraham, when things come on your life that shouldn't be coming on your life, the enemy attacks you, people defraud you, people lie, slander, cheat, whatever they want to do. You're on your way on your assignment for your heavenly father. And while you're wanting to reach out to lost people and bring the message of the gospel to them, the devil tries to put sickness on you. The devil tries to put pressure on you. All your washing machines and all your microwaves and all your TV breaks down at the same time. Your car breaks down. And it's a bit of a coincidence, but hey, just things go wrong. There's agitation, there's negativity. You feel stress. That is an uninvited attack on your life. And because it's uninvited, it's illegal. It's illegitimate. It's counterfeit. It has no authority to attack you. The enemy has got no authority to attack you. And when you understand that, there's, there's something you can do about going into the courtroom of heaven and calling on God to bring vengeance, to bring justice, so that the enemy must pay back what he's stolen from you. Every dream he's stolen from you, every vision you've had. I've got vision and dreams from when I was a little boy, and, and God's fulfilling it as we preach around the world. But we, we can't afford just to go, oh, you know, we, we don't need a courtroom, Lord. We don't need justice. We don't need your vengeance. We need our God to be opening everything we're doing so we can finish our destiny, get to where, where we're meant to arrive. We are running a race, and we must get right to the end. We're not running a race to get into heaven. The moment you believed in Jesus Christ, you are born again. You are guaranteed heaven. We are running a race to finish a destiny an assignment, a purpose that God gave to us. And the enemy doesn't want you to finish it. And so when you hear the word vengeance, I don't want you to think of a silly, childish, emotional reaction. We're not talking about human vengeance. We're talking about God, the vengeance of God. And God is not childish. He's not insecure. God is complete. There's nothing broken in Him. He doesn't react out of a temper tantrum. This is not about hatred. This at the center of vengeance is in the heart of God is justice. And God is a God of justice. And if God's people do not know about God's justice and that he will bring out vengeance against the enemies, that, 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 that in the human heart, there's a longing for justice. And so when people lose sight of a vision that God will bring vengeance and justice and he'll make the enemy repay and God will fix the damages and he'll compensate. And you'll recompense and make the enemy give back far more than he stole from you. When you have that sense of justice, you have a sense of hope. You have a sense of courage. You know you've got a courtroom to go to that's not an earthly democratic courtroom. It's the courtroom of the living God. 
And you can go into that courtroom. We're going to learn how to do that. Can you say amen? That's why praise and worship is really important. The Bible says we enter as gates with thanksgiving and we enter as courts with praise. You come in with praise because you know you don't have to mourn what you've lost because you can get justice. You can get the vengeance of God breaking out and Him fighting your case for you. Jesus is our lawyer. He's the counsel for our defense. And His case is a perfect case. It is a victory of the finished work of the cross. And stuff we're going to see here tonight. So if you read sometime when you can, Isaiah 61, and you'll see from verse 2, it speaks about declaring the year of the Lord's favor and the day of the vengeance of God to comfort all those who mourn. Now we know that the day of favor or the year of favor is the year of Jubilee. Maybe you don't know that. Most of you should know that. That's on the calendar in Israel. Every 50 years, God said all debts are canceled. I will give you so much favor that you will prosper and you will not have to work for one whole year. And and, and, and you'd like that in Hong Kong. We'd like that. And then Jesus comes and says, I am that year. You don't have to wait 50 years anymore. I am favor. I am your substance. I am your day of your year of favor. So every day we walk in favor. And then the day of vengeance is not a day anymore in the future. Jesus he is what, he, what happened at the cross, and we're going to read now, that the, the, the vengeance of our God is released to comfort all those that mourn. Can you say amen? amen. A lot of Christians need comforting from mourning because they stepped out one day and were going to go for the purposes of God, and the devil illegally slapped them, slapped their children, slapped, made them sick, diseased, took their money. And slowly they just think it's not worth it, you know. It, it, you can't get anywhere in the purpose of God. You try and reach the lost and the enemy attacks you. And friends, when they know you have dominion, you have an authority from heaven, your God will bring vengeance. And it's not about getting bitter with people. It's not about you don't get the vengeance. It, 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 this is a New Testament concept, the vengeance of God. It's not just Old Covenant. Right throughout the New Testament, it speaks about the vengeance of God. And you'll be surprised how often that word comes up in the Greek and in the Hebrew in the Old Covenant. And it over and over again says, you don't seek your vengeance. You don't get revenge. You don't attack anybody. You don't get bitter. You don't get twisted. That's what the devil wants, you to get all bitter and twisted. No, but if you understand this, you bring it before the courtroom of God, and He will give you vengeance. He, you can keep your heart pure, unpolluted with anger. God will give you justice, and you will walk through under the protection of God. Now, come on, say amen. So let's look at uh, Genesis 22, and I want you, as we read this, this is the Bible, friends. This is what's held my life together, this Bible. Not people's opinions, not religious traditions, not ideas that the church gets that are, that are not from the Bible, sucked out of the third letter of imaginations, and just traditions come in and people believe some strange things. I want you to see how that God takes an oath. Now, when God takes an oath, it's something that can never be reversed. He doesn't do this often. It only happens a few times in the Bible. When God says, I swear by myself, when He says that, It means he can never reverse that. It's like someone putting their hand on the Bible and saying, I swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. When God swears by himself, if he violated his oath, he would have to be sucked into a vortex of nothingness and disintegrate into implode into nothingness because his whole integrity is put on the line when he says, I swear. So he's going to do this. In Isaiah 54 verse 9 and 10, he also takes an oath and he swears to people of faith in Christ the new covenant people. He says, I swear that I will never be angry with you again. I take an oath that I'll never withdraw my favor from you, and I will never withdraw my peace from you. He takes an oath. Grant talked on peace. He took an oath. I want, so, so anytime youth as a believer, that, now that is not for unbelievers. Don't think for a moment that God can't get angry with some unbelievers. You're going to see tonight that bird doesn't fly in the Bible. That teaching that after the cross, God can't get angry with unbelievers. We're going to prove tonight that's not the truth. It's to the believers in Christ who believe in the new covenant 
To them, God's taken an oath. I'll never be angry with you again. Because the anger is taken away at the cross. No more condemnation. The grace and the love of God is for us in Christ Jesus. And God's going to take an oath here to bless the seed of Abraham. I want you to see it's not the seeds, plural. It's a singular seed. Very important. And then he's going to say to the descendants of Abraham... He's going to give them possession of cities. He's going, to, he's going to drive their enemies out, and he's going to give them whole cities. The New King James says, he will remove your enemies from the gate of the city. Now, a gate is a place of access and entrance to have influence. Hong Kong has gates in it. And either these demonic powers and principalities sitting in those gates and dictating belief systems in people's minds, Forms of unbelief, idolatry, counterfeit ideas, and their gates. And those gates should not have the devil sitting in them. Because God takes an oath here to a believing people in the Bible that if you understand vengeance and justice and how to come into the courtroom, you will see our God remove our enemies from the gate of our cities and regions and towns and nations and the seed of Abraham take possession and bring the influence of the garden of Eden and the grace of God and God's will on earth as it is in heaven, as Jesus prayed. Amen. So let's, let's read it. Uh, Galatians 22, verse 15 through to verse 18. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven, and he said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing I, blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies in your seed. Everyone say seed. seed. Singular. In your seed. In your seed, Abraham. In your seed. All the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So all Abraham did was, was willing to offer up Isaac. And God said, okay, you're willing to offer up your son. Now I'm going to bring my son into earth to save the earth. Can you say amen? And so he said, no, don't offer up your son. I've got a ram. I've got a substitute. And so that was the deal there. That Abraham's faith obedience opened the door for God to release his firstborn, his only beloved son, into the earth to die and redeem us from the curse of the law that we can become the seed of Abraham. All right. So great promises, isn't that? All right. Now, look, go to Galatians chapter 3. And let's ask ourselves, who is the seed of Abraham? Very quickly. Who is the seed of Abraham? This is very important because a lot of Christians don't know this. They actually don't know who the seed of Abraham is. They think it's natural Israel. Well, if you read through Romans 9, 10, you'll see it's not natural Israel. And God actually says that if that, that all people born of a Jewish lineage are not the seed of Abraham. There must be people born of the promise, which is faith in Christ. Both Jews and Gentiles must come through Christ in order to be the seed of Abraham. So it's natural Israel, but then you've got supernatural Israel, which is the church, which is neither Gentile or Jew. It's new creation. It's a whole new species of being on the planet. They're not Jews or Gentiles, Chinese or Westerners. They're actually a new creation order. They are the children of the Most High God. They are the sons of God and the daughters of God. So let's see as the seed of Abraham. Galatians, did I go too fast there? Galatians chapter 3 verse 16. Oh, turning the pages of the Bible. Look at this. See, See, this is called the Bible, this book. It's really good. Yeah, it's in the New Testament. Thank you, Trevor. I just forgot where I was for a moment. Galatians 3 verse 16. All right. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. The scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but, and to your seed, meaning one person, who is Christ. So this oath God made to Abraham, to the seed of Abraham, he made it directly to Jesus Christ. That through Jesus, he would dispossess cities of our enemies. Through Jesus. But hold on. Singular seed. One person. Jesus. All right. Let's just read verse 29. Same chapter. If you belong to Christ. How many of you belong to Christ? Okay. Then you need to, If you don't belong to him, you need to get saved. 
the most intelligent thing on the planet right now is become a Christian. Become born again. Believe on Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Well, who is Abraham's seed? Jesus or you? Because it's only one singular seed that the promise was made to. And so the one verse says Christ is the seed of Abraham, singular. But it says if you belong to Christ, you are the seed of Abraham and an heir according to the promise. What promise? All the promises God made to Abraham. Is you, you are a seed of Abraham. So you see, the Bible says in Romans 8 that you are a co-equal heir with Christ. Everything Christ has inherited after the resurrection, you have co-equal inherited. You didn't get 50%. You got 100% of what Christ got. You got it all. Amen. Amen. You got everything. He's the last Adam. And he got back what first Adam lost. And he got back much more. First Adam had only authority on the earth. And he illegally gave it to the devil who became the false god of this world, causing sickness and disease and heartache and brokenness. And the devil tried to offer Jesus this world in Luke 4. He actually said, it's mine. It was given to me. Who gave it? Last Adam. But on the cross, Jesus canceled first Adam's lease. He canceled the devil's lies and deceptions and his power. And he judged the devil at the cross. And he judged all of our sins and redeemed us from the curse of the law that the blessing given to Abraham can come to us, it says in Galatians 3. Amen. So we have in Christ Jesus, the singular seed, co-heirs with Christ, we are the seed of Abraham in Christ because he's the seed and you're in him. You belong to him. So the promises made to Abraham's seed belongs to the church of the firstborn. And yet so much of the church doesn't even know that these promises are ours. That we have a court, we have an authority to say in any city we're in, principalities and powers that are affecting people in a negative way, destroying their lives, destroying marriage, destroying the quality of their lives. We have authority to say, we own this city. We're the seed of Abraham. In the spirit, in humility, we own this city. We want to bring the influence of the kingdom, the favor, the goodness of God to fill every building in Hong Kong, every street, to fill the government, to fill every school, to fill this, uh, the city, that everyone will become the seed of Abraham. And the nations will look at Hong Kong and go, whoa, we see an Eden-like atmosphere growing in that big, beautiful city. Come on, can you say amen? That's what we're looking at. So let's... Let's look how this works. If you go to Exodus chapter 1, this is the Bible, guys. I know some people switch off when you read the Bible. They want you to just tell them stories and vivid illustrations and lots of jokes, which I love doing. But sometimes you just got to read the Bible so what we believe is well-based and we know where to go when we're on our own. Rob's not preaching and the devil comes and attacks you. I know, I know. It's Genesis 22 seed. Yeah, Galatians. I've got that. Okay, let's go to Exodus. Hey, listen to me, devil. Let's go to Exodus. Not, I don't know what to do. I need, a, I need a little priest to help me. You don't need a priest. You've got the great high priest. His name is Jesus. You've got a heavenly lawyer. You've got a God is for you. And he wants to bring justice against those that break against you. Can you say Amen. Look at this here in, in Exodus chapter 1. You're listening so good that we can get through this quickly. Exodus chapter 1. This is a, about 350 years after God swore the oath to Abraham. And now it becomes Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All of them are blessed. Jacob has sons, and one of them is Joseph, who you know became the prime minister of Egypt, even though he was a Jew. And how he went from the pit to the prison and then to the palace. And he saved his whole nation from starvation. The Jews came into, into Egypt, and God so blessed them there because of his oath to Abraham. Okay? Now look at, look at this in verse 6. This is when Joseph had got old and died. Verse 6 to verse wherever. Six. Verse 6. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. But the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied greatly and became exceedingly numerous so that the land was filled with them. So city church multiplies and gets full. So we go to like seven services on a Sunday with a building that can seat a thousand people in it. And just hundreds get saved every week because that's the blessing. They multiplied. 
And the land was filled with them. Hong Kong be filled with the seed of Abraham. Then a new king who did not know about Joseph came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become much too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies, fight against us and leave the country. Pretty paranoid people. So, So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, and they built Python and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. Don't underestimate the power of the blessing on the seed of Abraham. <laughs> so the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with hard labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields and all their hard labor, the Egyptians used them ruthlessly. So you've got this, every time a church starts getting a, a, a expansion in Hong Kong or anywhere on the world, starts seeing the lost saved. In three weeks, we saw 27 people make public confessions of Jesus Christ in this month. That is supernatural. That is awesome. That is amazing. Don't think the enemy like that. As soon as the church starts growing, seeing healing, seeing some miracles, seeing the lost getting saved, the enemy goes, hey, this is, they're multiplying. We've got to put some control over them. We've got to put spiritual slavery on them. We've got to make their washing machines. We've got to make them sick. We've got to, we've got to, we've got to break their finances. We've got to do something. And so what Israel does in the middle of this, they then bring their case before the God of heaven. They, they bring their case for justice and vengeance against what the Egyptians are doing to them. And look what it says in in, uh, chapter 2, verse 23 to verse 25. During during that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God, went up to the throne of God. That's what our Thursday nights are so important to come to. But we cry out, not just for us, but unto God, for people in religious, spiritual slavery in the city. And verse 24, listen to this. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned with them. Now, suddenly, the court of heaven is going to bring vengeance, and it's going to bring justice to the seed of Abraham. Can you say amen? Are you guys still with me or are you gone home already? Okay, let's go to chapter 3 and verse 19 to 22. Redemption, getting saved, immediately reverses the devil's damage on your life, in your spirit, in your soul, in your emotions, in your body, in your finances, and in your relationships. Another whole message to preach soon, coming soon in a theater near you. We so underestimated salvation. So every time you come out of the devil's containment, every time he's restricting us, and I'm not going to let people get saved. I'm, I, he's really fought hard in the city to stop people coming out of wheelchairs, lots of blind eyes opening and deaf ears open, and the dead being raised. That, that's happening quite a lot wherever we go. We're seeing people come out of wheelchairs, blind eyes open, even in Europe. But in Hong Kong, that's been, there's a direct reason for that. And we need to come to the court of heaven and bring this case before God. There's an illegal stopping of greater mighty works of healing, opening deaf ears. These are normal in the kingdom. They're normal for Christians to walk in the signs and the wonders of the kingdom. Amen. But there's, there, there is a puppet master pulling puppet strings and pulling his puppets around and stopping the move of God through religious traditions and r- wrong ways of thinking. And so look at this. Look at this, verse 19. But I know that the king of Egypt, this is God speaking now to Moses. I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. I want to tell you, the the enemy in Hong Kong is not going to let the churches step into revival, into signs and wonders, going after the lost, actually desperately want to see people saved. He's he's not going to allow that. But unless we know the courtroom of God and we get our vengeance of our God to bring a mighty hand against these illegal spirits. Come on, are you still with me? So God says, verse 20, So I will stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, He will let you go. After that, city church, you will grow to 10,000. But look at this as well. Verse 21, And I will, God's saying, I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed to this people 
so that when you leave, you will not go empty-handed. Every woman, I'm glad you asked the woman, not the men. Every woman is to ask her, that's her Egyptian neighbor, and any woman living in her house for articles of silver and gold and for clothing, which you will put on your sons and daughters, so you will plunder the Egyptians. There's another whole subject on wealth transfer. There's wealth transfer throughout the Bible. God moves wealth from the unjust and puts it in the hands of the just. Because the just know what to do with wealth. They don't spend it on themselves in greed. They know what to do with wealth. It's for the gospel. Can you say amen? Now, in Psalm 105 verse 37 says, When Israel came out of Egypt, they came out laden with gold and silver, and there was no feeble person amongst them. In other words, people have been slaves for hundreds of years, came out so rich and so wealthy, and they came out none sick. Millions were healed in the power of the blessing that was on Abraham. Can you say amen? And then, look at this. Uh, one more scripture out of this Exodus, and then we, we're going to try and bring this to close in about three hours. No, no quick, we're going to quickly take it into the New Testament. But look at, it, look at Exodus 4. Now, now, please hear this with an open heart and think of how loving God is. And don't misunderstand this. Our God is not a semi-senile Santa Claus. He's not a sweet little domesticated pussycat. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And I think that the church and the, and the world needs to again get a revelation of the mightiness of the living God, the holiness of God, how awesome is God, and a healthy fear and reverence should come into our worship, into our prayer, and into our daily. Our God is an awesome God. So look what he says here. He tells this, he speaks to Moses, Exodus 4, 22 and 23. He tells Moses this. He says to Moses, verse 22, Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go, so he may worship me. But you refused to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. Now that is vengeance. It's not revenge. It's not a murdering God. It's not an evil God, as some people say. This is a protective father over his firstborn. He has sworn an oath to his firstborn. I will protect you. And I will dispossess the, the enemies of the gates of the cities. Amen. This is not a God retaliating in a, in, a, in a fit of anger. This, you see, I don't know how to explain this. I've met God from the time I got saved. I spent hours in forests. I didn't go to movies a lot. I didn't travel the world what my friends were doing. I spent hours from the day I got saved... All the years of 38, 39 years walking with Christ. And I got to know God by encounters with Him. And I studied the theology. Not in a theology school because they don't help you. Not, not all, but some. And I studied the Word of God and I read books. And when I hear the pathetic, shallow ideas about God by petty men that sit as the jury and put God on the docks and judge God's motives out of the impurity of the content of their hearts... Our God is a holy, perfect, loving, merciful, gracious God. And when He expresses anger, it is clean anger. It is pure anger. It is holy anger. It is righteous and appropriate anger. And He's protecting His seed. And I want to tell you, throughout Scripture, you'll always see when the judgments of God break out, as they will in the book of Revelation with the seals that will be broken open, it will be to judge Babylonian systems. The Babylonian systems on this planet are religious, economic, political systems that have rebelled against God. In the book of Revelation, you will see what's going to happen when the seals are broken open. Babylon is going to have the vengeance of God, and God's going to deal with the rebellion of man against the living God. I'm so happy my God is an awesome God. He's not Santa Claus. He loves you and me so much. He's made, taken an oath. He'll never be angry with us that are in Christ. But God did not make this oath to the world. He only made this oath to the seed of Abraham. And anyone can become a seed of Abraham by repenting of self-righteousness, by repenting of the unbelief in grace, repenting of the unbelief in Jesus. Let the sin of, that, of unbelief in Jesus, let that convict people's hearts and let them simply believe on the Lord Jesus, repent of the unbelief. They can be born again and they can be a seed of Abraham. And then instantly the oath of God is towards them. The seed of Abraham. This oath God took is not to the world. It is only exclusively to the seed of Abraham. 
And people outside of that seed, they don't have the protection or the vengeance of God bringing justice to them. Can you say amen? amen. Then they have to rely on the Babylonian system. And they have to rely on the court system as well. It's nothing wrong with it. going to court in Hong Kong. I'm just saying there are some cases as a Christian, as you're seeing around the world, they are prejudiced against believers. Even in America, it's happening now. Pushing prayer out of schools. And you can go to court. But sometimes the judge you're going to get there is going to bring a wrong verdict. Because you're the seed of Abraham. And they don't want. And the puppet master is pulling the judge's strings. So when you don't get what you need there, go to a higher court. And you'll see how laws will change in the land. All right. And I like it with Christians always wanting to go to natural courts. Why don't we go to this court? Okay, and the Bible says in several places in the New Testament that the New Testament church is the church of the firstborn. We are the firstborn. If you believe in Christ, you're the seed of Abraham, you're part of the firstborn church, and our Father loves us, and He has vengeance to bring justice for every, every dream you've had, every desire you've had, every bit of money you've had, every time you stepped out and wanted to do something for God. And when you were stopped, you can bring that case before God and He will avenge you and He will bring justice to you and He will pay you back for He's kept a record of everything the enemy has illegally stolen from you. And if He's controlled you in, a, in this prison of slavery and broken your emotions down and you're fearful and timid and depressed, the, the living God wants to, you to bring a case so He can release you from Pharaoh by His mighty hand and bring the church into that place of freedom and into big thinking. Come on, give Him a shout. All right. So let's look at uh, three more quick scriptures. Here. Let's go now to the New Testament where people say, well, after the cross... The world doesn't get judged. Well, let's, let's see if that's in the Bible. <laughs> Sounds really wonderful. When you, oh, people can run around this planet killing Christians, attacking the seed of Abraham. God's just going to ignore it. Let's see if that's true. Okay, let's go. Acts chapter 12. Acts 12. All right, you, you remember Herod. Remember King Herod? You guys can concentrate for a little longer? couple of minutes you remember Herod he was a he was a shallow a horrible man really he had John the Baptist beheaded a bit like Arsel Arsel's cutting heads off just at the womb of some little sex maniac girl and let's take this precious prophet that announced the coming of Christ let's just cut his head off for the womb of this sexual little girl and that hurt Jesus and yet you know Jesus could not bring the vengeance of his father on the earth. When he was heading towards the cross, he did not come. He had to go to the cross. That was his purpose. Are you with me? And then Pontius Pilate, when Jesus has been tried by Pontius Pilate, Jesus says, answers to Pontius Pilate that eventually Pontius Pilate is so terrified because he cannot cope with the wisdom of the seed of Abraham in Christ. And, and, and he just doesn't know what to do because Jesus... It doesn't answer all of his questions the way he wants to. And, and he says to Jesus finally in Luke 19, he says, Listen, man! South African accent Pontius Pilate had. I have the power to have you crucified or released. And Jesus stands there calmly and says, You don't have that power. He said, Any power you have is given to you from above. And he says, And the one that's empowering you to do this is even more guilty of sin than you are. So it wasn't his father empowering. It was the devil, the puppet master, falling into God's ambush. Because Jesus had to go to the cross. And so now Pontius Pilate does, he says, oh, you're the king of the Jews. He, Jesus says, it's right that you say so. So eventually he goes, I, I've got to get Herod. He's, he's the king of Galilee where this guy comes from. So Herod, King Herod comes in there. In, in Luke 23, and now he's, he, the Bible says he wants to meet Jesus because he's heard about the miracles and he wants to see Jesus do a miracle. And so he, Jesus, if you read it, it's, it's, I love watching Jesus. So secure. He just stands there and he doesn't answer one question of Herod the king. He doesn't dignify Herod, this rascal, with one answer because he knows what's in Herod's heart. And so Herod gets a little bit upset. So, oh, you're the king of the Jews. They put, it says, elaborate clothing on Jesus. 
They put it all over him, and then Herod and his soldiers ha, ha, begin to mock him. Mocking the seed of Abraham, mocking God the Son. And the only reason he gets away with that is because Jesus had not come to be saved, but he had come to go to the cross. And Herod and Pontius Pilate are ambushed by God's secret wisdom for our glory, the cross. And so they fall into the hands. The devil falls into the ambush of God. So Jesus is not ready to call down fire. Even on the cross, he said, I could call down 10,000. I could nuke the place. I could bring nuclear power from heaven and nuke all of you. But he says, that's not what I'm here for right now. And when his own disciples in Samaria say, let's call fire down Jesus on the Samaritans. And Jesus said, you're of the wrong spirit. You don't know what spirit you are. He wasn't saying... That will never happen. What he's saying is, right now, our mission is to go to the cross. But that's going to come after the cross. So people have said, oh, Jesus saying, don't use that old covenant thing. Listen, friends. Pontius Pilate was playing, and Herod was playing with their, their sick leaf. <laughs> the arrogance of man to mock the Son of God. Wow, it grieves me. And so after the resurrection, the apostles go and the church just goes wild. They just start preaching Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. And they get whipped and they get hit and they get abused. And the devil's going crazy and he wants to stop them all. And you see what they do. In Acts chapter 4, they come back, they come back to um, the, the church prayer meeting in Acts chapter 4. And they, they come to the prayer meeting. They come to the Thursday night prayer meeting. And, they, and, they, and, they, and, they, and, they, and the Bible says that they, they actually give thanks to God that they were found worthy to be whipped for the name of Jesus. There's nothing in them about being cowards and going, listen, we don't want to share the gospel. It's too tough in the city. There's nothing about that. They bring their case to the courtroom of heaven. And they mention Pontius Pilate and Herod by name. Now Herod is in trouble. Because the, the seed of Abraham has brought him before the court of God. And you see the power of God breaks out straight away after that. Jerusalem is shaken. The people getting saved. Signs, wonders, healing. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the ruling, controlling religious class don't know what to do with the church. So they, the devil, the puppet master, pulls the puppet strings even harder on Herod and all of them. And the church just keeps going to the throne of God and bringing vengeance from God. So... So finally, Herod thinks, you get you on Acts 12, Herod thinks, hey, when I kill the apostles, I get more popular. It's like, this is what a politician's like, a wrong politician. It's like, what will please the people? It's no heart, no conviction, no integrity, no substance, just shallow human beings. You've got no identity in the seed of Abraham. They have no idea why they're on the planet. They've just been pulled by strings by the puppet master. And so he has uh, James, the brother of John, killed. And the people go, Aah! say, Whoa, I, well, I'm going to take Peter now. I mean, he's like the main guy. Let's get him. So he arrests Peter, puts him in jail. And he says, man, now we, we're really going somewhere. You're going to kill this guy. I'm going to really take over Rome, man. I'm getting popular. And so Peter's lying in jail. And the Bible says in, in, that the church begins to pray. The prayer meeting, Thursday night. They begin to pray. See, we're at the church prayer meetings without the church praying the courtroom of God has been wasted and the puppet masters moving puppets around to crush the church so that much of the church is full of unbelief and fear and doubt and don't believe and believe God can do miracles and he's a little God but when the church knows how to come to the courtroom for vengeance from our God and have justice shakalabandi and so, praise God, the church is praying, bring it before heaven. And suddenly, Peter wakes up. He's going to get killed the next day by Herod. And he's sleeping. That's faith. And angels walk in, and the chains drop off, and they lead him by the hand. And the Bible says that he felt like he was in a trance, and he didn't even know if it was really happening. That's what the Bible says. You must read this book. I promise you, it's better than any novel. God's in this book. And Peter's walking. This way. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And unbelief ca comes by hearing, and hearing by religious traditions. Faith comes by hearing, and the more you hear this, faith is coming into your heart. When the faith comes into your heart, you can just step into these things. You can do these things. Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing the Word of God. 
People can go and watch a three-hour video on The Hobbit or something, but they can't listen to the Word of God for more than 10 minutes, and their minds start wandering. Puppet strings. Someone gets up to go to the toilet. Everyone looks so exciting to see someone going to the toilet. Not you, not you tonight. I'm saying around the world. In this church, there's an increasing, growing hunger for the living Word of the living God. We want to know this book. We want it in our hearts. And he walks out and he walks past the sentries. They stand in there with their weapons and they don't move. And the angels takes them out and he gets outside. And Herod's mad. And so he kills all the, the, the gods. Just kills them all. Now look at this. Let's, let's look at this now. Acts 12. And let's come to the first closing. Two more to go. Acts 12. And I want to remind you, this is after the cross. Verse 21. This is a few days after Peter gets out of jail. And they brought Herod before the court. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, this is the voice of a God, not of a man. Immediately, verse 23, immediately, heaven gets to a point where God's slow to anger and he lets people get away with the most horrific thing and when he suddenly acts everyone's shocked immediately because Herod did not give praise to God an angel of the Lord struck him down and he was eaten by words worms and died but the word of God continued to increase and spread when the puppet master was brought before heaven's justice and God broke out in vengeance against Herod. The word of God spread. What is that saying? The word of God is locked and is contained and restricted. And the churches and claustrophobia and pythons of, in the spirit are just locking the church up in unbelief. But when they bring it before the court of God, they come out of restraint and containment. And the word of God spreads. Yeah, one, more, one more read and we close. It, just another chapter. After the cross, okay, after the cross. Acts 13, verse 5. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogue. John was with them as their helper. Now, now look at verse 6. There, there's a proconsul who means he governs the whole area. He's a man of influence. I'm looking for the men and women of influence in Hong Kong who have influence and who are intelligent and they want to hear the word of God. And so, as Paul's going, the proconsul invites them to come and show them what the gospel is. And then the demons try to come and stop and oppose it. And watch what happens. This is for Hong Kong. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was an attendant of the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, Roman. The proconsul, an intelligent man... Sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elamus, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them. Every time you want to lead someone to Christ, the puppet master is trying to oppose you. Opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, being a cute, charismatic Christian, said, that's okay then. Everyone can just do whatever they want because we've got such a small little God. So to hell with you all and we'll try somewhere else. No, sorry. I'm sorry. I just thought I was in the modern world. Okay, let's go. Then Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimus and said, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. You will never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord. Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You are going to be blind and for a time you will be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately, everyone say immediately. Immediately mist and darkness came over him and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul from Hong Kong saw what had happened, he believed for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. Come on, guys, how are cities going to be broken open and dispossessed? The gates dispossessed, the enemy dispossessed, the controlling access influences, not demons and 
the idols and principalities and powers, the prevailing influences and mighty power of the Holy Spirit, the blessing of God filling the cities. How's it going to happen with a weak, anemic church that is too scared to even share the gospel with unsaved people? That's never going to happen. Bit of persecution, they all lose faith, get all tired, oh, it's not worth it. But when you understand there is a court and there's justice and you, you, you have, you're not in danger, you have a God who's a good father and he will give you vengeance if you've got a prayer life. Amen. And so two scriptures, always, whenever this vengeance of God breaks out and puppet strings are cut and the, and the puppet master is exposed and dealt with, Look what always happens. If you look in the same chapter, verse 48 and verse 49. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord. And all who were appointed for eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region. You know, I, I came to Hong Kong with a very big vision. And, 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 and I was under no illusions. I knew it was going to take me decades. Well, I knew it was going to take a long time. We had quick growth in South Africa. and South Africa, you sneeze, people get saved. You can have churches of 20,000, 30,000. Uh, Australia was a little bit tougher, but we had a church of 1,500. We saw many people saved every week. Miracles going on television because of signs and wonders and miracles. When I came to Hong Kong, it was a whole different atmosphere yeah, 11 years ago. And I, and, I, and I just said, God, why am I here? And he said, because I'm going to establish a move of my spirit in Hong Kong that will touch the whole world. I said, Lord, how's it possible? I can't speak the language. No one knows I'm here. No one even cares I'm here. He said, I know you're here, and you're the seed of Abraham. He said, I will bring Chinese people, and firstly, there'll be English-speaking ones that can learn the language of grace into Chinese, which has already happened, and then more and more Chinese people will come, and you'll see you'll, you'll eventually gather momentum, and then suddenly you will have such acceleration that, that the Hong Kong will be known around the world as the place where the glory of God is, where the manifestation of the, not church and religion, no, where God's glory is manifested seven days a week. And when the church gets together, it's in freedom and jumping and praising and glory and celebrating what God's been doing all week. And people will stop coming late to church and honor coming on time because we get together to sit together to worship the king and we don't come in in installments. And so we leave whatever we've got to leave early and men lead the way. Come on, dear. Come on, honey. We're getting to church on time. Come on. We, gotta, we can do it. And so, But it's Hong Kong. We just come late. Well, not anymore. We, now we've got an important reason that we want to be early. Even coming and praying. Imagine actually before the service you spend time praying and say, Lord, I'm, I'm gonna, I want to get pumped up in the anointing. I want to be pumped up in faith. So by the time Rob gets up, we're already full of joy. He doesn't have to preach us into joy. We're going to just preach him into joy while he's preaching. <laughs> Come on. You've all done very well to, tonight, but that's because I was really brilliant. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> so let's stand together. And let's bring our case before the Lord. Why don't you just, um, just stand and just lift your hands, please. And, and Bonnie, why don't you just come to the keyboards. Just lift your hands before the Lord. <laughs> Father, I want to thank you so much. <laughs> that in your presence there is fullness of joy. And at your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. I want to thank you, Lord, that we can come through your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. Thank you that you comfort us when we mourn because of loss or damage that's been done in our lives from an illegal enemy. You comfort us, Lord, not in just sympathy, but you comfort us by breaking out in your vengeance against our enemies and bringing justice and causing them to have to pay back more what they stole from us. And Lord, as this church has courageously stepped out in June to seek the lost, to bring them into this house, and we've seen fruit come out of that, good fruit, we will not tolerate the enemy's reaction. We are not ignorant of his schemes. We're not frightened of him one little bit. He's frightened of us. We are the seed of Abraham. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We are the favored sons and daughters of the Most High God. We are ambassadors 
of the highest government in the universe. We thank you tonight, Father, that Moses did not bring Egypt to an earthly courtroom, an earthly democratic courtroom. We thank you, Father, that the early church did not bring Herod to an earthly court with an earthly judge. We thank you, Father, that Paul the Apostle did not bring that sorcerer to an earthly court, that they were brought to your throne, your authority, to your justice, to your power. And tonight, Father, we will not take for granted that we are the seed of Abraham. And we believe and we accept and we agree and declare and proclaim and we voice activate that vengeance is not ours, but our, the vengeance comes from our God. And Father, we bring everything of the enemy's attempts to hinder us, to restrict us, to limit us, and to contain us or to discourage us as we've reached out for the lost and the dying. We bring his illegal opposition before the courtroom of heaven. And we cry out to you, Father, for vengeance as the spirit of the martyrs under the throne are crying out, when will you bring vengeance, O God, in the great tribulation? We declare now, Father, that your vengeance is pure and clean and holy. And we declare, Father, our mission and our assignment is to live for you. We want people to be saved. We want the testimony of Jesus to fill the 8 million in this city, that the glory of our God would fill this city, that everything of the puppet master would be cut off, Father. And we come with a case that is perfect. We come before the lawyer in heaven, our great high priest, Jesus Christ, our counsel for defense. And he has the perfect case of the finished work of the cross. We thank you, Father, tonight. He has the perfect case of the oath that you swore directly to us as the seed of Abraham in Christ, that you will give us the gates of cities, regions, spheres, and jurisdictions. And we declare, Father, that men and women of great influence will be attracted to the light and the glory of a city church. We declare July, August will not be a month of just lethargy and laziness because of the heat and because many people have gone away. We declare this will be a month of multiplication, of increase, of momentum, of the fire of God in our lives, Lord. And we will see the lost being saved. July, August, September, October, November, December, in Jesus' name. Won't you, if, if, if you've had something taken from you, maybe you've been through a divorce and it was so painful, and the Lord loves you and he's, He wants to heal that. And, 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 or if you've had business stolen from you or your health, maybe you've had your health stolen from you. Whatever, something's been taken from you as the seed of Abraham that was illegal. Maybe someone betrayed you and slandered you. Maybe there's a Herod type person in your life that has mocked you and they, and they have no legal right. And, they, and the fear of the Lord needs to come upon those people's lives right now. To realize they're not dealing with just some sweet little charismatic Christians. But they're dealing with the seed of Abraham. Sons and daughters of the living God. And that they owe you respect. And you owe yourself respect. You need to walk with your sense of identity. What you believe about yourself is the way other people will treat you. If you don't have much confidence in who you are, people will treat you with disrespect. You are the seed of Abraham. You are the righteousness of God. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. There's no other name given among men by which we must be saved. And if you've got a case that you need justice, you need vindication, you need the God of vengeance to vindicate you and restore your credibility, I'm asking you just to where you're standing, just say, Lord, I bring that before your throne. I bring this case before you and I ask for your vengeance to give me justice. I'm not bitter. I forgive the people that did this to me. That's very important. Forgive them. Don't hold a grudge, but let God deal with them. I'll just do that for a moment right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Maybe you were illegally sued. Someone sued you sued your credibility 
defamed your name, God will honor your name. He'll make your name great. God said to Abraham, I'll make your name great. God's wanting to make your name great. God is making your name great. (laughs) God loves your name. And He's making it great. (laughs) Where's Linda? Linda, come over here. Why don't you come stand over here? We're going to just... He's going to release the power of God on you again. I know your back's been having spasms. Trevor, why don't you come stand behind me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Just lift your hands. Lynn. Lynn, you can stand out anywhere you want. Father, we thank you right now. Just reach out your hands to Lynn. Father, we just thank you right now that as they go on holiday, we, we want the rest of heaven to be upon them. That there be no pain and spasms and curvature of the spine. We just, we just rest. We decree, Lord God, that, that Linda's not going to get her healing today or tomorrow or the next day because you got her healing for her 2,000 years ago at the cross. And so we just bring the divine administration of the power of the finished work of the cross and the power of the blessing and the power of the authority of God. And we bring Linda before your court, Lord. And we believe that the spirit of oppression... The spirit of infirmity, the spirit of curve, the curved spines is a demonic spirit and it has no legal right. And then as you've heard the word, faith has come in your heart today. And uh, we declare, Father, that the power of heaven run right through Linda from the top of her head right to the soles of her feet, right up and down her spine, right now in Jesus' name. And let that fire of divine virtue literally put her back in line. And declare, we declare, spasms end. Spasm, stop now. Just line her straight, Trevor. Just put her uh, whole body 100% straight. We declare, Father, it, the spirit of infirmity is brought before the court of heaven. And we declare the vengeance of God breaks out now in Jesus' name and brings justice for Linda and pays her back, Father, a hundred times what the enemy has stolen, Lord. Let there be health and vitality and supernatural strength in her back muscles and in her spine, Father. Lord, we declare supernatural working of miracles to strengthen her back muscles, to hold that spine in place in the name of Jesus, right in in her hips, right in your hips right now. The Lord is just realigning your hips as well in Jesus' name, Father. And we declare that, Father, that her legs right now become the same length in Jesus' name. And we thank you for doing a full makeover, Lord, right now. This left one, this... This right one, right now, that's it. There it is, right now. Okay, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. (laughs) And now, Lord, fill her with joy. And may she just fly to the UK singing and laughing in Jesus' name, Lord. May she be so happy that eventually Trevor's irritated. (laughs) I'm joking. I'm joking. (laughs) And and, and then we we declare it done in Jesus' name. Now, now she... Where's Beth? Beth is going back to to have her baby in the UK. And this, um, I don't know, people know. Yeah, there was complications that sounded unbelievably, shockingly serious. The worst news you could hear about a baby. It's nothing worse you could hear. And most of that has been declared it's not true. As we prayed, as the parents, they've really prayed. But, but Beth has been a hero to you. I said to her tonight, well done. You've stood in faith. You could have lost your mind with that bad news. And you're a seed of Abraham. You're a daughter of the Most High God, and He loves your child. And uh, your child is destined for great things. And so, Lord, so she's going to go back and have a baby, but we release her. Father, we declare your glory over Beth in Jesus' name and your creative life your miraculous creative life to do even more of the supernatural blessing on this baby father and on Beth Lord we declare joy and favor we declare the angels go ahead we thank you as we bring Beth to the court of heaven we come boldly to obtain grace in the throne room of grace we declare what the enemy meant for evil we declare God turns it around for good in Jesus name father we honor you Lord God And we declare the vengeance of our God breaks out against the assignments of the enemy. And justice comes for Beth and the family. 
in Jesus' name. We bless her. We bless her with favor to go to the right doctors and the right place and the right hospital. We open, let the doors open beautifully for her, Father. Let the blessing of God go ahead of her, Father, in Jesus' name. Until we see you again. <laughs> now, we're going to, if, if you need to go, we understand that you, you, know, you might have to go somewhere. But if you would like to stay, we're going to all break bread now. It'd be about five minutes and then we'll be over. But we believe that breaking bread isn't a religious exercise. It is a, it's an act of faith. And if we had time, we could explain this to visitors. The only reason some people died and were sick about the breaking of bread is because Paul was making it clear that it's not the body of Christ being the church that people have sinned against. The talk, breaking of bread is talking about the body of Christ. So if you don't believe that by stripes were he, you were healed, if you don't believe that the blood cleansed you of all sin, the, the broken body is that all your sickness, diseases, and the curse of the Lord were laid on Jesus. So when you eat the bread, don't look for sin in your life. Look to the body that healed you by His stripes on the cross and believe in the power of the blood that has washed you. That's why people were dying because they weren't honoring the breaking of bread as, as a faith project. And so when I ever go to China and every church, when they break bread, it's like terror. They, if I do this wrong, I'm going to die. I wouldn't even eat if there was a risk. And then they sit the cup of and then they, they introspect to think of every sin and try to confess. Folks, that is old covenant bondage. And the, Jesus helped the church in China get out of this legalism. We bring a case, Father, before the throne for the church in China and in Hong Kong that your, your justice, your vengeance will break out against the puppet masters that have made people do these religious traditions that have led them astray into bondage. We're going to break bread as a party. woo He healed us. He's forgiven us. That's what the breaking bread in the early church was. They were sometimes getting drunk. And they said, don't, don't get drunk. You know, but they were having a party. They weren't going, have I got any sin? They were having a party, friends, because that's what it is. So let's just pass the bread down. When you get the bread in your hand, just hold it, and we're going to do it all together. So get